The Life and Death of Hans and Sophie Scholes, Part 2. So, uh, Hans and Sophie Scholes, two German youth in the 1940s who uh, died at the hand of their government, the Nazi regime, uh, for crimes against the state, you know? And crimes that, you know, had much to do with their speech, much to do with expressing, you know, their criticism of the government that was in power in their country, uh, the government that, um, you know, sought to proliferate its uh, racial homogeny over the population, over the greater populations of Europe, you know, a, a government that was informed and inspired by uh, Charles Darwin and his cousin, who coined the term eugenics, uh, truly World War II had much to do with eugenics and social Darwinism. You know, we fail to appreciate that in this day and age because we try to superimpose the issues of the present onto the past and say, well, this, <clears throat> the past can be understood through the lens of the modern world. <clears throat> but the truth is, man, that the that you know, world 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 war two belonged unto itself a time in the late 1930s and early 1940s. And in this time and in this place, these two, this German brother and sister in their early 20s going to college, uh, began to you know, under, under the cover of night, spread pamphlets that they had created, pamphlets uh, that criticized their government, pamphlets that critic criticized the Nazi regime, you know, pamphlets that found fault with, uh, with the, with the animated effect of uh, the Nazi ideology. You know, from the context of the time and the place, man, because hindsight is twenty twenty. you know, Hans and Sophie Scholes were not time travelers, right? They didn't, they didn't go back into time to criticize the Nazis. They were there in the, in the thick of it. They were there in the midst of it, surrounded by a society that would not tolerate uh, deviation from the status quo, you know, a, a monopolar society, a, 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 you know, I've, I've often thought that, that fascism is, you know, monoculture, the singularity of an idea that enforces its dominance, you know, in, in replace of criticism in replace of, of, of freedom of thought, freedom of speech, an enforced mono ideology that, that fascism is akin to this. Fascism, fascism is in many ways so much like this. And in, and in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, man, you could not criticize, you could not, you could not question. And in fact, if you were found to have been listening to certain kinds of music, it was an affront to the law and to the German people. So said the, so said the regime, right? Certain books you were not allowed to own, not allowed to read. Certain ways of dressing, you know, and, and we, we today, we think of, you know, we think of, when we think of dress codes, I don't know, but <clears throat> I'm sure that that it was a burden to bear in those days. And so here you find this brother and sister, and they and some friends of theirs started this private group, secret group, underground group called the, they called themselves the White Rose. 
And they, uh, in 1943, February 18th, uh, the Nazi authorities laid hold of them and put them to death uh, for spreading, for questioning the legitimacy of the Nazi effort. And so uh, that the anniversary of that day is, is approaching. So I'm doing a series of videos here. Uh, and, it, and it's derived, the, the real content is derived here in from this book that I'm reading. It's called uh, The Heart of the White Rose. And it is uh, letters that Sophie and her brother Hans uh, wrote to each other and to their friends and diary entries uh, that they penned, you know, right, with their own hand and with their own thoughts. And it reveals and it, it unpackages for us, right, the motivation of their sentiment and what animated, right, the effect of their efforts, you know, the, the volitional root of why they were doing what they were doing. Because like I said, man, they were not time travelers. They're not, they did not come back in time, right, to resist uh, the outflow of Nazi eugenics, authoritarian Nazi eugenics, right? They did not, they did not uh, flow out of the future with 2020 vision. They were, you know, thrown into the midst of it. It, it arose around them as they grew up as teenagers. This is the world that they knew. And so the question is, you know, where, you know, from, from whence does their portent of belief arise? From whence does it arise? These German youth in the throes of German society, surrounded by Nazi authoritarianism and monoculture, mono society, the singularity, the fascist state, the authoritarian state, you know, from whence does, you know, from whence does their volition arise? You know, what belief to what purpose and cause, man, would they lay down? Are they willing to lay down their life? Because the understanding is, is that, that particularly, I, I guess, as regards Sophie Scholl's, the German, the, the Nazi authorities gave her the opportunity to, to squeal on her friends and in so doing, be sent home, you know, maybe with a slap on the hand, be sent home. And she chose not to. She chose not to squeal on her friends. And so straightway, man, they sent her to the gallows. You know, and ended her in a day. So I'm re I'm reading out of this book here, and I'm just gonna you know this these uh, videos are just gonna ma mainly it's gonna be me reading stuff out of this book of their letters. So here's another. Uh, this is a letter that Sophie wrote to this friend of hers named uh, Fritz. Uh, she wrote him a lot of letters, and uh, this is on. <clears throat> so we're reading out of uh, At the Heart of the White Rose, Letters and Diaries of Hans and Sophie Scholes, uh, page 282, down at the bottom of the page. She says, man, Sophie says, as I, as I did that night in Blumberg, I'll keep on repeating it for us both. We must pray and pray for each other. And if you were here, I'd hold, I'd fold hands with you because we are poor, weak, sinful children. Oh, Fritz, if I can't write anything else just now, it's only because there is a terrible absurdity about a drowning man, instead of calling for help, launches into scientific, philosophical, or theological dissertation while the sinister tentacles of the creatures on the seabed are encircling his arms and his legs. 
and the waves are breaking over him. It's only because I'm filled with fear that and nothing else and feel an undivided yearning for him, meaning God, who can revive me of it. I'm still so remote from God that I don't even sense his presence. When I pray, sometimes when I utter God's name, in fact, I feel like sinking into a void. It isn't a frightening or dizzying making sensation. It's nothing at all. And that's far more terrible. But prayer is the only remedy for it. And however many little devils scurrying around inside of me, I shall cling to the rope God has thrown me in Jesus Christ, even if my numb hands can no longer feel it. Please remember me in your prayers. I won't forget you either. Yours, Sophie. I told you, man. <laughs> so I'm just finding stuff in this book that is just like, you know, that, that jumps out. But there's so many things in this book. Like, I could be doing, like, I could read you this whole book. We're like, this is like 300 pages. And I could just read you the whole thing. And the whole thing is like this. You know, just this, this, the musings of this, of Sophie and her brother. <laughs> right? <clears throat> but what is she saying? What is she saying? And only because there is a terrible absurdity about a drowning man who, instead of calling for help, launches into scientific, philosophical, or theological dissertations while the sinister tentacles of the creatures on the seabed are encircling his arms and legs and the waves are breaking over him. I mean, this it's... Uh... <laughs> She is, what is she saying? She's saying that, that intellectualism can, we can deceive ourselves as we, you know, as we argue and debate our intellectual constructs, right? The, the facade of the structure of ideas that people will occupy themselves with can uh, be a way of evading reality. The facade of intellectual ideas, right? Because no doubt, <laughs> uh, I mean, let's, let's look at the context here. 1942, Germany, the facade of intellectual ideas that evades reality. The eugenics, social Darwinism of the Nazi regime, the mono society, the singularity of thought is certainly an example of the intellectual pomp and circumstance and the construct of words that can sound, you know, like like a, a clang a clanging symbol, and yet not reflect reality. And the reality she's pointing out is the absurdity of a man that is drowning, the desperation, right, of the fathoms that are swallowing him whole. And the tentacles of the deep that are surrounding and enclosing upon him, his arms and his legs, right? And the waves that crash above him. And he goes into, and, and though that this reality, this most real, you know, reality, the mortality of his life slipping from him, and yet... He will obscure, man will obscure the truth and the reality for their intellectual constructs that will exist for a moment. Because no doubt this drowning man can argue only so long 
before his last breath slips from him. And so Sophie is pointing out this, this, the absurdity of the facade of ideas that people are so ready to embrace as though it is, it is like a human outgrowth. There's something so natural to humanity to engage in this over heavy rhetoric that obfuscates what is true, that obfuscates what is real, you know? And one might conclude from it like that the weight, the true and real weight of a moral reality is like the weight of water. It is heavy. It is heavy and we are in this world. It is, it is with or without your opinion, with or without your approval, this, the moral weight of reality exists. And yet people will obfuscate their guilt. They will obfuscate their accountability, their responsibility by engaging in all of this construct of thoughts and wherein they debate and argue and hate because I tell you what, to keep the obfuscation alive, you gotta you gotta add some hate to the fire to keep it going. To obscure what is true and evade what is real. And and Sophie is confessing, and she confesses, right? How where we are poor. This is the this is the reality. This is the truth, right? Without the rhetoric, without the the professional class of ideas that spills from the universities on any given weekend. The truth of is it, the truth of it is that we are poor, weak, sinful children. Right? Living in an adult reality. We are poor, weak, and sinful children. And nothing else can deliver us but God who saves men and the lifeline that is Jesus Christ. And she, and she goes on to confess like her need. She says, I am so remote from God. That is a confession of like a real confession. This is not some like philosophical, theological thing that she's just repeating, regurgitating, you know, from her theology textbook, right? She's saying, I am so remote from God that I don't even sense his presence. This is, this is how she feels. Like this is romanticism in its real form. I don't sense his presence when I pray. Sometimes when I utter his name, in fact, I feel like I'm sinking into a void. It isn't a frightening or dizzying making sensation. It is nothing at all. And that far more terrible but prayer is the only remedy. So she will press on in her prayers because she believes in God. She knows that he is, and she believes that she rewards those who diligently seek him. She believes this. For prayer is the only remedy. And however many little devils scurrying around inside of me, I shall cling to the rope God has thrown me in Jesus Christ, even if my numb hands cannot feel it. Like, that is faith. She's going to cling to the rope that God has thrown her, that is Jesus Christ, even if her numb hands cannot feel it. This is this is the romanticism of Christianity, to, to know the truth, you know, through, through hard times, to, to walk on water in the storm, right? To walk on water in the storm and not be dismayed by the waves and the darkness and the blast. And it is... It is with this courage that she went to the gallows and betrayed not her friends, right? The scripture says that 
No greater love than a man has than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Uh, anyway, uh, this is part two. There's going to be a part three, four, and five. Probably some other parts that will follow. So be true, be free.